I'm so excited to have gone after Dr. Maynard because I will continue with discussions about disparities. I'm sorry, my mouse is a little finicky. Um, thinking about um, differences between males and females. And we're gonna be talking about this in the context of our immune system. And I am uh, the, the PI or the director of two different centers here at Johns Hopkins. I direct our specialized center of research excellence in sex and age differences in immunity to influenza as well as our Excellence in Pathogenesis and Immunity Center for SARS-CoV-2. So if that doesn't tell you that I'm very interested in viruses, immunity to viruses, then I don't know what does. So, you know, I'm gonna keep this high level, but I think for anybody interested in further discussions with me, um, our discussions would be specific to influenza, SARS-CoV-2, infections, and vaccination. And so much as was, discussed in the previous talk, um, when we talk about differences between males and females, there is a biological component, but there is also a social construct in terms of what defines us as being men and women or male and female. And so when we talk about our biological sex, this refers to the determination of what makes us male or female, um, based on our sex chromosome complement. So whether we have two X chromosomes or an X and a Y chromosome, for a majority of us, this is dichotomous, but there are absolutely conditions or what we would call disorders of sexual development that can lead to, uh, to differences in, in that sex chromosome complement, as well as in development of gonadal tissues. So for the typical male, those would be testes. For the typical female, those would be ovaries that are going to produce and secrete differential concentrations of sex steroid hormones. So the combination of our sex chromosome genes as well as our sex steroid hormones really define our biological sex, which for a majority of us, again, will be dichotomous, but we can absolutely have aspects of biological sex, both our sex chromosomes, as well as gonadal tissues that do and can occur on a continuum. In addition to thinking about our biological sex, we know that there is the societal or, or cultural aspect of, of our gender. So gender is really distinct from sex, despite these terms often being incorrectly used interchangeably. And this construct of gender really refers to differences between men and women based on things like our lifestyles, our nutritional habits, as we heard about earlier, exercise, perceived stress, smoking. These are all just examples, but you can even see how our, our social and cultural norms that define us as being a man or a woman could impact things like access to healthcare, utilization of healthcare, even the ability to make decisions about your own health, which can lead to biological impacts through either our behaviors or through epigenetic effects um, on, 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 these, on these biological aspects of our sex. And again, collectively, this can impact our immune system and the outcome of diseases associated with our immune system differently for males as compared with females. And so this really reflects the, the basis of research in my laboratory and the basis of the collaborative research in the centers for which I direct. So I think a point that I'm gonna to wanna to make with you now and then bring it back to this at the end of my short period of time with you is this question of does equal mean the same? And I think both in medicine as well as in public health, we often, we often seek for one size fits all approaches. We're seeing this right now with the SARS-CoV-2 vaccines. It's easiest to determine that everybody gets the same doses. Everybody gets the same vaccine because when you're talking about mass campaigns, that is gonna result in the safest and easiest distribution. 
but I'm going to question whether that's the best. And, and we're going to walk through some examples that I'm going to share with you that are going to bring this into question. And I'll, I'll come back to this and I'll, I'll attempt to answer this question for you by the end of my discussion. So I think we're in the middle of a pandemic. Hopefully we're on the tail end of that pandemic as we're, as we're seeing uh, the world open back up, at least here in the United States is, is maybe a better way to phrase that. But our immune system is there to protect us. It's to protect us against not just viruses like influenza or SARS-CoV-2, but maybe bacterial um, infections like tuberculosis, um, parasitic infections like those that cause malaria. Um, and, and, and this is, it's an elegant system. It's a system that seeks to identify something foreign that has entered our bodies and attack. So this is our foreign invader or our virus. It attacks, so we've got immune cells. They're gonna make proteins that are gonna attack this foreign invader. They're gonna generate responses. They may be able to engulf this foreign invader. And this is all here to protect us and to subsequently provide us with some memory. And it's those memory responses that are going to protect us from reinfection and that form the basis of vaccination. And so in this context, the immune system, as I said, it is an elegant system. It is an elegant orchestra of lots of cells, many of which were described beautifully in the, in the talk before mine. Um, and, and, and proteins and signaling pathways that really are there to protect you. But there are times where these responses can actually be what harm us. These can be the same responses that cause um, allergy induced asthma. These can be the same responses that can cause autoimmune diseases if they're targeted against yourself. These can be the exact same responses that lead sometimes to adverse reactions to things like vaccines, which we've been reading a lot about in the past several months. So thinking about the balance that needs to be achieved and how that balance can be different for men and women is a part of what my group studies. And generally what we find and what others even report are that females mount greater immune responses than males. And I'm gonna talk about the pluses as well as the minuses of those greater immune responses in females as compared with males. So because I am an XX female who identifies as being a woman, I'm gonna start with the downside of, of this biological female typic immune response and then end with the upside. So inflammatory diseases are typically more common in young adult women, meaning women of reproductive ages. Whether we're referring to inflammation of the skin, so development of things like dermatitis, eczema, all much more common in women as compared with men. Inflammation um, in, in the bone, so development of things like arthritis, which we often don't think about as being immune mediated, are in fact immune mediated. We can have inflammatory diseases of the lungs, things like allergy induced asthma, where you have a, a very robust immune response to an allergen in the environment. An allergen which should otherwise be viewed as harmless, our immune system can see as harmful, leading to an infiltration of many of those immune, immune cells that were described previously in the context of prostate cancer can also infiltrate our lungs to cause inflammation, swelling, constriction of our airways. Inflammation, inflammatory diseases of the gastrointestinal tract are also significantly more common in women as compared with men. Things like Crohn's disease, um, uh, um, 
inflammatory bowel disease um, would be two fantastic examples of inflammatory diseases of the gastrointestinal tract that are much more common in women as compared with men. As a result of these examples of inflammatory diseases being much more common in females as compared with males, it also turns out that women are significantly more likely to be taking medications um, that are, are used or designed to limit these types of inflammatory diseases. So women as a result are much more likely to report adverse reactions to many of the medications that are utilized to limit these types of inflammatory diseases. Uh, the statistic that's often given, which every time I say it is just shocking to me, 80% of all autoimmune disease patients are female. I mean, that is a staggering statistic. Autoimmune diseases are caused when your immune system improperly begins mounting a response against you, against your own tissues, your own cells. And then those memory responses that I described to you are in place and they continue to be mounted against your own tissues and your own cells, leading to the chronicity of autoimmune diseases. Pictured here are just a handful of, of autoimmune diseases. There are many more. These just list some of the more common autoimmune diseases with pink reflecting incidence in females, blue reflecting incidence in males. So stereotypically, I hope you see that the incidence of these very diverse autoimmune diseases is greater for females as compared with males. And to this day, we're still trying to uncover why this is the case, both the genetic as well as the hormonal, even how environmental factors may be contributing to how it is that females are significantly more likely to develop autoimmune diseases than males. So I'm now gonna I'm now gonna switch gears and and talk a little bit you know not just about the downsides of having more robust immunity in females but let's talk about some of the upsides at least for biological females. Well, it turns out that a woman's immune system is better able to fight off infections, and so my lab and others have contributed significantly to really uncovering um, how it is that, that the immune response to infection differs um, for males and females and, and, and how that can lead to differences in what we would call the pathogenesis um, or the course, if you will, of infection. Um, and we and others have reported this to be true for viruses, including HIV, as well as hepatitis B and C viruses. Prior to the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic, which many of you on this call likely know uh, results in worse outcomes for males as compared with females, we knew this to be the case both during the SARS epidemic that occurred in the early 2000s, as well as the ongoing MERS epidemic in the Middle East. Ebola tends to result in worse outcomes for males as compared with females, as does tuberculosis, bacterial pneumonia, malaria, toxoplasmosis, schistosomiasis, and amoeba histolytica, all examples of various bacteria as well as parasites for which females are better able to fight these infections as compared with males. To give you just an example and keep this current, during the first wave of the COVID-19 pandemic, my group was one of the first to report a male bias in fatality rates across diverse countries and age groups. And so here we're looking at case fatality rates in panel A across diverse countries. And listed here were 38 countries that were reporting sex disaggregated data. Um, many countries, unfortunately, do not. 
and early in the pandemic, um, we saw several countries in Europe experiencing very high case fatality rates, including countries such as Italy, whereas countries in, in regions of the world, including Africa, so here we have South Africa, were reporting lower case fatality rates. Regardless of whether these were high or low case fatality rates, male stereotypically blue, female stereotypically pink, we were seeing greater case fatality rates among males as compared with females, which is still being reported um, currently um, around the world. When we look at data, and there were 12 countries that disaggregated case fatality rate data, not only by sex, but also broken down by age, we find that among all adult ages, ranging from 20 years of age onward to upward, of 90 years of age, across these diverse age ranges, there are significantly more males within these age ranges that were dying from SARS-CoV-2 infection as compared with their age-matched female counterparts. I do want to point out, though, that while we do see this age associated increase in case fatality rates among males, we also see a very similar age associated increase in case fatality among females. So that age associated change is occurring in both males and females, even though we consistently find that males are more likely to die from SARS-CoV-2 infection than females. The other aspect of my lab and, and, and a huge area that we work on, um, primarily in the context of influenza vaccination, but now more recently in the context of the current SARS-CoV-2 vaccines, is to study vaccine-induced protective immunity against infection. Um, so including these responses to vaccines, which my group has consistently shown to be greater in females as compared with males. And so which vaccines specifically? Well, we and others have shown that women produce greater immune responses to vaccines against influenza, hepatitis B, among teenagers for the human papillomavirus vaccine, the rabies vaccine, among older adults, the shingles vaccine, even the smallpox vaccine. To date, we have not seen um, any data sex disaggregated for the current SARS-CoV-2 vaccine. So my group is actively studying this now. But what we have seen is that women not only produce greater vaccine-induced immune responses, but they're also more likely to report experiencing adverse reactions to vaccines, um, including the flu vaccine, measles vaccine, the human papillomavirus vaccine, tetanus vaccine, and most recently, the SARS-CoV-2 vaccines. So how is this occurring? Okay, so I want us to be thinking mechanistically. I'm a biologist and that's precisely what we do. And my group considers um, how genetic differences between males and females might contribute to differences in the functioning of the immune system between males and females. So men and women, we have the same um, sex, we have the same chromosomes um, in place when it comes to the autosome, but the sex chromosomes are where we have substantial differences in which females have two X chromosomes and males or men have an X and a Y chromosome. I love this phrase and it was, it was, it was, it was termed by um, Barbara Maijan here at Johns Hopkins in, in genetics, in which she referred to women as a mosaic when it came to the X chromosome, because we inherit, we inherit, excuse me, a sex, an X chromosome from our mother, as well as an X chromosome from our father. And we are made up of the random expression of X-linked genes from both our mother and our father, making us a mosaic. Males, on the other hand, only inherit their X chromosome from their mother and inherit their Y chromosome from their father. So they will reflect only the expression of genes on the X chromosome that are maternally inherited. 
So that's one difference between males and females in the context of sex chromosome. Another difference occurs in the actual expression of these genes. Just because females have two X chromosomes does not mean that we have greater expression of all X linked genes. But it, there is a process of what is referred to as random X inactivation in which a, one copy of each X linked gene is supposed to be randomly inactivated. Well, it turns out that in humans, roughly 15% of X-linked genes that are encoded, again, on this X chromosome, escape X inactivation and show greater expression in cells from females as compared with males. This has been shown to underlie development, greater propensity for development of autoimmune diseases, including lupus in females. And my group has shown this contributes to the greater immune responses that we observe in response to flu vaccination among females as compared with males. Our sex steroid hormones differ in their concentrations and secretions between biological males and females, with hormones such as estrogens being found in higher concentrations in females as compared with males, whereas males show higher concentration of testosterone um, as compared with uh, their female counterparts. So the point I wanna make with you is that we do have differences in the concentrations of these hormones between males and females, as well as changes in the concentrations of these hormones over the life course, with there typically being a reduction in the secretion of these hormones in both men and women over the life course. Of course, this, this secretion and production of hormones by the ovaries and, and the decline that occurs with age is much more dramatic in females as compared with males with that dramatic decline occurring during the time of menopause, which in women, the normal ages of menopause can span from our 40s to our 60s. In males, it's much more gradual, but you do see a decline. My group has shown that these changes in hormones that occur over our life course contribute significantly to the age associated reduction in vaccine induced immunity and efficacy that we see in both males and females as we age. So I've tried to give you some examples of both diseases as well as mechanistic insights into how the immune systems of males and females can differ. And to date, these facts have not contributed to considering whether there should be different doses of vaccines, different treatments such as immunotherapies for cancers or, or immunomodulatory drug treatments for things like asthma or even arthritis, autoimmune diseases between males and females. And what I really want to leave you in my audience thinking about is whether or not we need to be given different treatments for equal protection of males and females. And with that, I thank you for your time. Great, thanks very much, Sabra, for, for a wonderful talk and a really interesting uh, dimension in terms of thinking about the, the science of diversity. Um, we have a couple of questions. Um, so one is, could the statistics of 80% of autoimmune patients being female also be related to differences in health-seeking behavior? Who is more likely to seek medical care in the first place? Such a great question. So yes, I think that intersection of sex and gender plays into that 80% statistic. And I, 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 I bet you already had the answer. Um, females in countries where women have equal access to healthcare and decision-making, 
women are significantly more likely to seek out healthcare than our male counterparts. Now with that, what we do find is across very diverse countries with very diverse social norms for healthcare utilization, we still find that females are more likely to develop autoimmune diseases. So the current state of the literature is really leaning towards some biological explanations. And here's another question from Miriam Tucker. Can you comment on the female predominance reported in the quote, long COVID unquote phenomenon? Do you think that's immune mediated or autoimmune? That's something I was wondering about also. Oh, such a good question. So, I mean, the honest answer is we don't know. So we have many, many of us, myself included, are, are, are studying this now, but to make sure that we're all on the same page, in a number of countries, including here in the United States, it's being reported that um, a, a significant majority of the long COVID patients are female. Mm -hmm. um, and, and again, this gets back to the, the previous question, is it biology or is it social? You know, because some of the, the symptoms, the most common symptom of long COVID is fatigue. So is it that women are more likely to seek out healthcare with something like fatigue than our male counterparts? We don't know. Um, is, it, is it an immune system um, disorder? So you may have heightened immunity. Um, there's a lot of interest in how immunity to SARS-CoV-2 can actually trigger autoimmune responses and whether some of the features of the SARS-CoV-2 virus mimic features of our own proteins and cells resulting in development of some autoimmune types of immune responses which have been reported. So today we don't have, uh, I don't have actually an answer for you other than to say, I think you're on the right track and many of us are studying this. I've got one final question I was wondering about. So if there's a greater uh, female immune response to vaccines in general, is that accompanied by um, increased perdurance of the prophylactic effect of the vaccines? That is such a good question. So my group is studying this now in the context of the flu vaccine. Is there greater durability of that immunity? And, and we have some preliminary evidence, both in our animal models, as well as in our, our human volunteer studies here at Hopkins, that the answer is yes, that, that that greater immunity in females is maintained at least over the course of a year. Um, so, and I do think this is going to become very interesting as we start to contemplate boosting um, for the, the current SARS-CoV-2 vaccines.